We're very privileged today to be having a public conversation with Dr. Carol Favotko. Carol's one of Australia's leading experts on climate change, <clears throat> global warming and global boiling. She's currently the recipient of an Australian Research Council Fellowship held at Griffith University, where she's focusing on climate change and its interaction with social, cultural and political life in Tuvalu. She's not content to be an abstract scholar, however, and has worked with organizations such as the Australian government's CSIRO, the International Organization of Migration, UNICEF and the Migration Policy Institute. She's published widely in the field and we're very pleased to gather her wisdom in this conversation. So welcome, Carol. Welcome, Carol. I'd also like to introduce Dr. Volker Berge, who's um, a senior research fellow and director of TODA's Climate Change in Oceania program. <clears throat> and he's responsible not only for the program, but for the design of this interview. Carol, you've been working on climate change and migration, mostly with a regional focus on the Pacific for almost two decades now. Can you tell us what initially triggered your interest in this topic? Well, it wasn't so much migration um, alone, but the issue of entire national territory being at risk from climate change that I was interested in. And back then I'd recently studied law as an undergraduate, um, including international law. And the idea that statehood and sovereignty um, was at risk seemed like a really important issue from an international law perspective. But I soon found out that there are important cultural, social and political dynamics that interact with the way that the science and the law um, um, can um, and perhaps need to be changed to deal with the risks of sea level rise in the context of small island nations. And it's a continuing research interest today because the problem has not really been solved. Um, and the idea of people moving away as a solution um, to sort of climate change risks um, is only a very small part of the issue as I see it. Carol, and you are, you are married to Tuvaluan. And so, so we are wondering, uh, you have family relations in Tuvalu, whether this has an impact on the way you approach your research and also your everyday life uh, because you are, have to engage with two worlds, so to speak, with the societal and cultural context here in Australia and also in Tuvalu. Uh, what what does this do to your, your research? Yes, so I do work very closely with my husband, who's a um, Taukia Kitara, who is a um, climate change activist and also a community development practitioner. And so it really is a family um, undertaking and a close collaboration um, with others, you know, family members and um, friends and contacts in Tuvalu. Um, so our family life very much informs um, our research. So even though we're based in Australia, we're part of the Tuvaluan diaspora, um, but we're also Australian citizens as well as being Tuvaluan citizens. So we sort of straddle both worlds, like many, many people who migrate um, from the Pacific to places like Australia do, like Tuvalu is still very much a part of our lives um, from a family point of view as well as a research point of view. So, for example, um, it matters very much to us, <laughs> you know, whether Taukie's family lands back in his home island of Nui will remain habitable from both a research perspective as also from a um, family um, personal perspective. Um, so... It does also have some challenges, I guess. Um, for example, when we get to, to when we arrive in Tuvalu, sometimes it's hard to get into research mode when we just want to spend time with family that we haven't seen for a while. Yes. Maybe as a follow-up question to that, do you, do you does being married to a Tuvaluan um, give you some sort of privileged access which others who are no, who don't have those same kinship connections wouldn't have? Yes, I, I think it does. Um, but at the same time, you know, we, tr we try not to sort of um, think that we somehow speak for all Tuvaluans. You know, we still have to do really solid research. Um, and in some ways um, it, that, that raises some more sort of ethical um, 
obligations on our work. So it actually kind of raises the stakes a little bit in terms of, you know, how do we negotiate these relations with both research um, participants as well as potential family members because the society is so small, everyone's kind of both. Um, so we have to be really careful about how we um, negotiate that and see it more as an as a obligation than a kind of privilege, I guess. But we certain, I certainly do have the, the benefit of Taukye being obviously fluent in both the Nui language and the Tuvaluan language, which are the languages spoken in Tuvalu, um, and and all his contacts and all those sort of things. Um, so, and, I, and I'm, I'm very grateful for that. And I'm also very grateful for the fact that he is, um, does a lot of his work as a kind of volunteer, a research volunteer. Uh, a lot of it um, ends up being an un, in an unpaid capacity. So he really he really does it, you know, because he loves Tuvalu. Um, and, and, you know, the, the main reason why I guess I continue to work on Tuvalu is for, because of this personal connection. So there's a lot of responsibility there. Great, thank you. And you're thank currently you. working as a future fellow on an ARC project with Griffith University. What, what's, what's your um, Australian Research Council project about and what are your research questions and what do you hope to achieve with that project? So my current project was inspired by the way um, Tuvaluan and other Pacific Island societies started to rethink resilience and development during the pandemic in a really kind of fundamental ways. So broadly, um, the project aim is to understand what Indigenous solutions to global challenges such as pandemics, climate change, et cetera, look like. Um, so I'm using the idea of home as a kind of fluid dynamic and often mobile construct in Pacific societies, particularly in the context of Tuvaluan societies that operates at different scales. So for example, home can be um, simultaneously a fam family dwelling um, as well as an island or a village community and also often a nation. And so it's like that multiple concepts of home. And I'm trying to use that to study how indigenous innovation works um, to enable people to continue feeling at home wherever they happen to be. And in this context, you are very critical about this uh, idea or this prediction of future mass climate migration. And uh, you are talking about this as an unscientific expectation, this migration across international borders. But this narrative is very popular at the moment, both in more progressive circles who want to raise the alarm about the effects of climate change and also in more conservative circles who talk about waves of climate refugees threatening the national security and uh, the borders of countries in the global north. So um, what is your, your criticism of this um, narrative of um, future mass climate migration? Well, essentially, it's not, it's not based in science. So once upon a time, the science, maybe 20 or 30 years ago, the science did have some models that predicted those kind of large numbers. Um, but the science has moved on in quite significant ways since then. And those large numbers have been really quite unequivocally banished by those who do climate mobi mobility modelling. So you don't find those kind of numbers in recent quantitative science these days, and you certainly won't find them in authoritative um, scientific kind of um, sources such as the IPCC reports. So the issue was that the science was kind of simplistic, so there were assumptions that nobody would do any kind of climate change adaptation and the only option would be to move. So these kind of simplistic assumptions since, you know, adaptation, um, science and practice, practice has come in over the last couple of decades have been, you know, clearly needed to change. Um, but unfortunately, those numbers <laughs> won't go away um, because <laughs> I think they are quite newsworthy, as you point out, and so it's been difficult for some people to let go of them. And this... Um, is actually sort of evident in not so much in the scientific sort of um, academic journals, but in 
policy statements and uh, websites and things, and particularly from the UN system, where UN bodies will say things like they understand that these big numbers are no longer reliable, but then in the next sentence they'll say, oh, here are the debunked numbers anyway, <laughs> um, without quite referring to them as debunked. So there's sort of this um, hesitancy to let them go because they were so useful at one point for raising the awareness of this um, issue of climate mobility. But now we know, you know, very much that most um, most movement will be internal rather than across international borders and very much in terms of local um, local movement rather than long distance movement. Anyway, that's what the science kind of expects at the moment. So it's really interesting to me that those very large numbers from a couple of decades ago are still being published, to be perfectly honest. And there's, I think there's some, some work to do around that, um, particularly by the policymakers who seem to think that they're, the numbers are still worth repeating. And that's, that's a nice segue into the next question, which is, which is around that whole question of climate change induced mobility in the Pacific um, in the form of migration, displacement and relocation. Um, what, what are your primary concerns with regard, regard to that sort of inevitable uninhabitability narrative that, uh, you know, that there's a sort of a, a, a remorseless logic to all of this and it's going to result in uninhabitability and uh, forced relocation? Well, yeah, it's, it's actually quite similar, I think, to this issue of large numbers of climate refugees um, being circulated despite there being no acceptable science on it. So I think the same is very much true of the inevitable uninhabitability narrative, although it might be a little bit more subtle. Um, there are scenarios, worst case scenarios that say, you know, uninhabitability may happen. Um, it's very difficult to put a time frame on it, but what we do find now is that kind of, um, scenario situation being kind of um, rephrased as a certainty by certain organisations. So you find um, particularly among those with some, you know, authority and power to say things in the public communications like at nations will disappear by 2050 rather than saying they may disappear by 2050 under certain certain scenarios. So that sort of certainty creeping in um, doesn't is not reflected in the science. There's no there's no certainty about when it's going to happen or or even how. So um, the fact that those kind of statements don't acknowledge, again, don't acknowledge adaptation, which is extremely important in um, maintaining habitability. Um, is one red flag. So, you know, adaptation is going on. That means habitability is being maintained. So um, that needs to be taken into account. Um, but also there's the issue that science doesn't really have a good handle on what habitability thresholds actually are. So it's an incredibly comp complex issue. And it's not just a matter of saying, oh, well, sea level rise is going to um, increase by so many um, centimetres or metres, that means that place is uninhabitable. It's actually a lot more complicated than that in terms of like um, how often flood events occur, how, how often how that impacts on um, food security, water security, all sorts of issues, as well as um, cultural issues about who knows this place well enough to deal with the floods, um, and that's often the locals. Yes, and of course, this raises the question who actually defines uninhabitability or inhabitability? And you have challenged uh, challenged that recently, haven't you? Yes. So um, together with um, John Campbell, we think that habitability is not something that can be fully understood by science. I think we, we argue that um, social science and also Indigenous knowledges are super important and local knowledges are super important in understanding habitability. And this is partly because, um, you know, there's a relationality between a people and its place and it's very specific to context. Um, so you can't sort of apply sort of scientific rules um, in one part of the world and expect them to be the to sort of produce similar outcomes on habitability elsewhere. That's what we think. So... Particularly so, I think, for subsistence and Indigenous societies, um, 
there are very specific, culturally specific sets of practices and knowledges um, which, which can also change in, in, in the context of a changing environment um, that together produce whether or not the pl a place is conceived as livable by the, by the current inhabitants. So, for example, even the idea of a flood, which we might think, you know, from a Western perspective is, is, is an inherently negative thing, is not necessarily seen um, as objectively ne negative by every community. Sometimes floods are seen as a re rejuvenation, an acceptable part of daily life, and not necessarily a disaster to be avoided. So when we take those kind of um, different perceptions of risk and weather and place into account, we can't really know for sure what habitability and uninhabitability will mean and to, for a particular population until we know the very specific meanings and practices that exist in that particular place. And so it's just important to kind of recognise that Western science is not going to hold some sort of mythical objective code for identifying how a place shifts from habitable to uninhabitable. And John and I think that, you know, this can really be only fully known by those who live there, drawing on, you know, expert, maybe Western science as well. But the central, the central kind of people who are experts in habitability are the people who actually already live there. And this is, becomes a question of local and Indigenous knowledge. Well, maybe that would be an interesting question for you to highlight. Um, um, which would be the sort of the different epistemologies that you're dealing with here that um, you, you've, you've outlined in a way quite nicely the fact that you've got differences between international experts and people in affected communities um, and that the understanding of land and habitability and interconnectedness and so forth um, are, 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 have, you know, have very different understandings depending on the context. Can, can you elaborate on that a bit more? I mean, uh, so is there a dialogue that's taking place between these Western and um, traditional epistemologies or, or is there just a, a gulf of miscommunication? I think there is increasing understanding that the, the two need to be in better dialogue, which is a good start. And then, I mean, there's a good examples from communities around the Pacific who are saying, you know, they want to stay put while external assessments are indicating that perhaps they should relocate. So ha having that sort of mismatch, I guess, is a sign not that the communities are taking an irrational response to expert assessments of climate risk, but rather that it's a sign that local knowledge of habitability is not necessarily being sufficiently, you know, centralised or understood um, by those who are thinking about this need for relocation. So. It's just a sign that there needs to be more um, consultation, more understanding of, of why people are saying they don't want to, to go and not with the idea that they, you're going to somehow be able to force them to go or force them to change their minds, but to understand why they think staying is a good idea. And so I think there's a really good um, role for good government support for relocation um, and in, we see that in places like Fiji, it's starting to happen and happen fairly well. They're taking community consultation very seriously, but still the trigger for relocation, I think, should be made by communities themselves rather than um, governments or, or sort of external kind of assessors. So I really do think that communities will mostly know when is the right time to start planning to relocate and to, you know, to respect that local knowledge that will that will, um, you know, underpin that kind of decision making, because we see that already. Some some Pacific communities, some sorry, in, even in Fiji specifically, some some communities are going, "Yep, yeah, it's it's time," and others are saying no. And I don't think that's because you know the, there's a lack of awareness on climate risk. I think climate, the awareness is quite good. It's more like what is the difference in this particular local context. About this particular community that they think they they can stay yeah and a couple of years ago you introduced the contact uh, concept of ontological security into this debate about climate mobility in in the pacific so what were your reasons for that and what 
is the added value of an ontological security framing of the issues at hand? Yeah, so ontological security is about a kind of abstract notion of security of being. So do people feel a sense of continuity and meaning in their lives? And it seems seemed to me that having a relocation or a displacement, particularly if the relocation was experienced as, as forced and unwanted, would be something that um, can disrupt people's ontological security. Um, because the focus was very much on material security issues like sh shelter and sustenance and livelihoods. The idea of ontological security looked at, you know, the more abstract notions of disruption that could take place, even if even if those, you know, sort of more material conditions were, were met well. Um, so it doesn't matter how, how well you, you know, reconstruct a village, if the people feel a great sense of loss in who they are, that's still going to be a major problem. So it, it was quite concerning to me that, you know, this sort of idea of ex existential threat of climate change was kind of being bandied about very freely. Um, but there wasn't a great deal of recognition that this might actually have an impact on people's kind of mental well-being and emotional well-being and, 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 and ontological well-being. So that's why I started talking about ontological security um, as something that maybe needed to be considered in addition to um, more traditional conceptions of human security in the context of you know, um, possible displacement. Great. In the uh, already mentioned article about uh, unhabitability, you use the term relational security. Um, I wonder if you could sort of explain what your understanding of relational security is, and is it an expansion or a reconceptualization of you know what you've just been talking about in terms of ontological security, or is it something quite different? Is this is this at the heart of um, a different understanding of of the world and your place in it? Yes, well, I think um, this was really an innovation of John Campbell's rather than mine, and he was drawing on the work that was being done and is still being done by Apollo Lumavai and others on relational relationality in in terms of you know indigenous um, knowledge systems and values in the Pacific. So the the argument from them was very much that ontological security is basically too Western. And I, and I think they're right. Um, and relational security, at least in the concept um, context of the Pacific, it captures much better that sort of non-individualistic relational qualities that people have, um, both in terms of community and place. So the, the shift to relational security tried to make it relevant to the actual people that are being affected rather than imposing a Western um, kind of concept that didn't really fit. The, the, the big question, of course, is how to maintain this type of ontological or relational security under conditions of climate change and use displacement. So mm. because you talked about the close connection of Pacific people to their land and the, yeah, the interconnectedness of land and people, what happens if to, to their ontological or relational security when they have to move? Yeah, well, it's not necessarily a given that ontological or relational security will be diminished, but I think the risk is very high. Um, it depends on many things like whether or not the relocation is done in a way that's very respectful of agency and culture and um, those kind of issues. Um, so, but I think it's taking a step back that, you know, to, to reduce the risk of this big rupture in um, relational security is to, you know, respect when people want to stay as much as possible so that that risk um, of, of, of sort of moving and having this um, threat to relational security happen um, is reduced in the first place. But it's also worth pointing out that any kind of relocation um, is actually very risky in terms of the material dimensions of human security as well. So you know less access to ed education for instance or livelihood opportunities 
Um, so you add that, you have to add that into the risk um, of ontological, um, ontological and relational security being affected as well. So for all these reasons, I think, you know, the, the, the sort of drive to relocate communities um, as a kind of solution needs to be really um, unpacked a lot more and, you know, to really go back to these kind of issues to think through the, the broad range of risks, not just the physical risk of, you know, something like a flood, but there's a broad range of um, facets to human security that need to be taken into account before relocation becomes, to be clear, is the best solution. Um, and But having said that, you know, it's not just relational security, there's also, you know, rights to self-determination, climate justice, and those kind of issues as well, which are not necessarily um, addressed, even if people somehow maintain their um, relational security throughout these kind of um, difficult moves or difficult fights to stay put. You know, I really appreciate what you're trying to say in terms of Tuvalu and um, traditional adaptation to the challenges of climate change and so forth. But uh, what also seems to be happening at the moment in countries like Fiji and Vanuatu is that they're planning the relocation of so-called vulnerable peoples and communities. Um, and um, donors from the Global North and others are happy to support these efforts. Um, so what's your assessment of these experiences so far, the problems that can be identified and the challenges that have to be addressed um, in relation to sort of... Uh, voluntary mobility being hardly recognised at all. Fiji and, and those kind of larger Pacific Island states where there, there's sort of a need potentially for a lot of community, local community relocations back back inland um, from the coast, you know, is to be commended in, in many ways because there's this sort of forward thinking, you know, how can, how can we adapt to these um, issues of sea level rise that are coming? Um, and like I said, there's there's good consultation, you know, respect for the sort of um, the the local governance systems and things in these communities from those national governments. Um, but by the same token, there aren't good, like you said, there aren't good uh, mechanisms in there to recognise when people want to stay. But there's this sort of assumption underlying a lot of these um, policies that are coming out that that, that relocation is going to happen at some point regardless really of what these communities want. And I think that might be a little bit too uh, premature. So there needs to be more time spent on figuring out with the communities um, which ones think they have the local knowledge to be able to withstand um, the impacts and which ones are saying that, well, we think relocation is too risky because it's going to, you know, disrupt our connections with our ancestors, things like that. But there, you know, there are, it's not necessarily an, a, a, an either or situation, you know, some parts of a village can move while others stay put or um, people can still have, you know, just as much access to the place, even though the houses are moved. There's, you know, there are, there are you know, relocation is not like a be all and the end all. And in those larger countries of the Pacific, that's possible because there is more land um, often still owned or, you know, customary land that's still owned by the same, the village. Uh, we know from, you know, development related relocations that have happened in the past that um, relocation is very complex. It's very expensive. And the science often says that, you know, relocation can increase vulnerability of people overall. So you're sort of, you know, looking to find a solution to vulnerability, but actually potentially um, risking making it worse in some ways, because just because your um, physical dwellings, for instance, are in a new place does not necessarily mean that your livelihood is going to be any better in that new place. So, um, you know, it's interesting that the more technological solutions such as, you know, reclaiming or raising land um, in some cases are very possible and feasible. Um, I guess the main issue there is also that these are also very expensive. So, um, but they can support those who want to stay. So I think, you know, there needs to be really good 
understanding that, that the both options are possible, not just not just one. It's not just a matter of moving people out of harm's way and everything's going to be great. Um, there needs to be a very deep consideration of, of how people who want to stay can stay because it might actually be um, creating more problems in the long term. Okay. Yeah, and another problematic issue is uh, the framing of international labour migration as a form of climate change adaptation. For instance, arguing that these uh, people who move to New Zealand Austra and Australia in the context of these specific guest worker schemes then can contribute by sending the remittances to the communities at home to local in situ adaptation. But you recently wrote an article together with um, TK, picking fruit is not climate justice. So, so what, is, what is your criticism of this, this approach to international labor migration as climate adaptation? Yeah, well, it was largely a sort of response to um, a few years ago when there were some leaders in places like Australia making quite... Um, problematic statements about you know that the Pacific Islands would survive because they get to come to Australia and pick fruit and it just kind of you know if you unpack that it's like well the workers themselves um you know are hardly the um you know the the leaders of their country making these major adaptation um investments and decisions um already these workers um, have very high social costs um, due to issues such as family separation and the risk of worker exploitation in some cases. And so, you know, despite the economic gains, which are fairly well documented, these social costs are actually also very high. And so taking in that into account, uh, we need to be very careful about how we might um, position labour mobility as a form of adaptation I mean, yes, yes, the remittances are useful, um, but to what extent should the workers have that sort of extra burden? It's like, it's like you know, we want adaptation finance to be separate from development finance. So the workers' wages, you know, um, maybe should be increased if they're expected to be um, adapting as well as, you know, providing more traditional development funding for their families. In some areas of research and policy labour mobility is being sort of positioned as this, you know, very, have a lot of potential for adaptation. And in some ways it does, but we just need to be really careful that the workers themselves don't experience um, problems along the way. And in fact, there's a lot of work to be done to ensure that that doesn't happen. For instance, the, the family separation issue needs to be addressed, I think. In so Cuba. There's, there's a long way from getting to climate justice through the labour mobility path in short. Uh, in Kiribati, uh, the former president, Enoti Tong, uh, championed the idea of migration with dignity against the background of climate emergency that his country was facing. And the current government under President Taneti Mamao insists on the right of Kiribati to stay in their homelands. And so you've got two very different government perspectives on responding to inevitable, well, potential inundation of the country. Where would you position yourself in the in this debate? Mm. Well, without <laughs> without being too, I guess, um, committed to either side, I would actually expand expand the um, perspective a little bit um, on both policies. So both of them were really about, um, you know, the, the the way in which economic development in Kiribati would um, be. Um, prioritised in a changing climate. So with, with Tong, you know, the migration with dignity was not so much about conceptualising some sort of one-way path to safety for the people of Kiribati. It was, it was about creating multiple kind of ways in which Kiribati people could, through mobility, international labour mobility, exercise agency and build trans transnational resilience with a kind of long-term timeframe. So through circular and economic and educational migration opportunities, the people of Kiribati would have these kind of choices to either move to a new country um, with these very um, highly desired skills, 
um, as workers, or they could bring those useful skills back to Kiribati and help build um, the economy and the society there. So it was very much about choice and agency of the workers and, 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 and creating sort of international networks. So some people would move abroad and start establishing, um, you know, Kiribati diasporas, which already exist, but, you know, expanding the Kiribati diasporas, which would then in turn, you know, facilitate migration down the track by others. It was very much a long-term plan involving circular migration um, as a way to sort of advance the Kiribati um, economy and the Kiribati kind of um, adaptation back home as well as, you know, migration abroad. So then when um, the new government came in, that was sort of become less important even though in policy, even though labour migration from Kiribati still, of course, happens and it's still a very important part of the Kiribati economy. But there was this sort of more emphasis on, well, climate adaptation is going to happen so that it um, is less about migration and more about building resilience in the island. So there was things like economic development would come through increased tourism industry in Kiribati, which would then help fund adaptation in place. So they were both sort of using economic development um, as a key to Kiribati's resilience. So there were similarities there, um, but obviously the second one was much more about in-place development and the first one, migration with dignity, was much more about um, incorporating migration as central to that. And I think they both have their merits, to be honest. I think, you know, potentially you could have a situation where both of those things are being pursued and there would be overall positive outcomes for a small island state like Kiribati. So a, a both and option instead of an either or. Mm, exactly. And coming coming back to Tuvalu and your Tuvalu connections. So together with Kiribati and also the Marshall Islands, Tuvalu is very often mentioned in the international discourse as particularly hard hit by the climate emergency. And uh, Simon Kofi really became a world famous figure at the Glasgow COP26, uh, I think it was, when he addressed uh, the international community standing knee deep in water. And after that, we did an interview with Simon Kofi, who is the foreign minister of Tuvalu, about his ideas for a plan B uh, for the people of Tuvalu in the case Tuvalu becomes uninhabitable. And this is when he also talked about this idea of the digital nation, Tuvalu as a digital nation in the metaverse. So can can you uh, elaborate a little bit on the current state of things in Tuvalu, uh, in particular with regard to the migration patterns, both internal and international, and climate change in situ adaptation, and the prospects for Tuvalu's future as you see, see them? Yeah, so um, Simon Kofa's digital Tuvalu was widely picked up by the global media. Um, and, and it is one of those important kind of um, multiple options for Tuvalu. Um, but like you say, it's like, it's like a plan B. It's not the main focus um, of Tuvalu's kind of adaptation strategy. Um, and the, that, that plan A, if you like, is a more um, focused on the physical kind of um, fortification and building up of the islands through projects like land reclamation. So that's really where Tuvalu is putting most of its energy at the moment. Um, so, you know, having plan B is obviously very smart, but then the plan A is even more important. And it was interesting that the global media picked up much more on the plan B than the plan A because plan A was also publicised at the same COP, um, but didn't get as much media attention. I'm not quite sure why. Um, maybe it's because of this, you know, sensationalist idea that it's much more interesting if the country disappears than if the country puts in place some, you know, good investment in adaptation projects that will help them stay. So I was in Tuvalu very recently, just a month or two ago, and these new major land reclamation projects are really dominating um, the capital, at least. 
uh, the people find them overall um, a good thing. There are some concerns about local um, environmental damage, um, but overall I think they're very well accepted by the people and, and they are offering um, good hope for the future. Um, there's, you know, major new uh, pieces of land in, in the capital that weren't there before, which have new developments on them. And, you know, this is a very kind of tangible, <laughs> tangible way for the people of Tuvalu to see that, you know, action is being taken um, by their government and by the international kind of partners that are involved. Um, and it's apparently a very um, cutting edge kind of coastal adaptation technologies, engineering technologies that are being used. So, you know, this sort of innovation within Tuvalu is, is extremely important um, in terms of migration patterns. I don't think we're seeing much. I mean, the pandemic, there was very little movement in or out of Tuvalu. So I don't think we've seen much increase in international migration over the last few years, um, but we're certainly not seeing anything like the masses of, you know, people leaving that the sort of climate refugee discourse might anticipate um, that's not happening. Internal migration um, in Tuvalu is still and has long been um, a fairly normal part of everyday life as people move between their home island and the capital for work and education and things like that. But what happened during the pandemic was that actually that was re reversed and a lot of people moved back to their home rural islands um, to at the beginning of the pandemic to try and avoid um, the COVID-19 virus. So, yeah, internal migration and international migration are not really being driven by climate impacts, although in some ways I think the kind of discourse of climate risk is actually making people pay more attention to their Indigenous um, practices and how they value their land. So what I have seen is a small amount of, um, you know, people on the capital, Indigenous people from the capital moving out to the more uninhabited islands of the capital where they have Indigenous land in, in order to be, um, you know, a bit closer to their more customary lifestyle, to, to teach their kids, um, you know, the more customary practices around fishing and um, harvesting crops and things like that. So, you know, in some ways, it's almost like a reverse of what you might expect. <laughs> People are actually valuing their place even more than they would have um, now that it's kind of at risk. Um, a few weeks ago, uh, Carol, you participated in a two week long Pacific of philosophy course at Pacific Theological College in Suva, Fiji. And, and I wonder if you could sort of help us understand what is Pacific philosophy and why is that approach important or even necessary for dealing with climate change, mobility, conflict and peace in the Pacific? And sort of a second question, um, you know, are there lessons from uh, grappling with that question of what a Pacific philosophy is for other regions or internationally that can be learned from the Pacific? The Pacific, Pacific sort of relational philosophy idea is very much tied to, um, you know, policy and practice and development kind of on the ground in, in the Pacific. So it's not, it's hardly, it's definitely not just an abstract kind of let's um, think about this in an academic way. It's very much how can Pacific um, Indigenous philosophers inform development work in such a way that it, actually fundamentally redefines the way problems are solved in the Pacific instead of using, um, you know, the, the, the Western philosophies, which do tend to dominate um, global development policy and practice to think about how, you know, Pacific Indigenous relational philosophies can be used instead as the foundation. So it's really quite um, radical rethinking of what Pacific development and solutions to problems such as climate change might look like. You know, so a, a, a specific example is that, you know, cult, not that long ago, this is, seems might seem surprising, but not that long ago, culture was actually seen in development circles as being a barrier to development. Um, 
And I think for many reasons, not just through the Pacific uh, philosophy kind of movement, but for many reasons, now we see culture as the foundation upon um, which, you know, the right type of development for the particular place and people should be built. And this is something that's applicable well but on the beyond the Pacific, you know, in many contexts in which Western philosophies have long dominated, but now, you know, there's starting to be this increasing recognition that it doesn't necessarily fit. So um, we need to go back to the to the actual ways that people relate to their place and to their resources and to each other in order to determine how best um, to move forward. I mean, from your own experience, do you think that there's a willingness on the part of the West to learn from the Pacific? Uh, or do you think there's always a kind of a sense of a, a privileged philosophy that, you know, eventually um, uh, Pacific Islanders will, will see the error of their ways and um, come back and conform to a kind of a Western notion of individualism and self-actualization and so forth? Yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to know, um, you know, within, I guess, my own small kind of world of development contacts and things, how prevalent that kind of thinking still is. But to be honest, I think it's, it's people may not fully understand how much work is involved and how much needs to be done and how they can help, but I think there isn't, starting to really be a recognition that it's important amongst many external like you know I, I will I will have conversations with people in I don't know some UN organization for example and they're very very interested in thinking about how really how this stuff needs to happen um so I'm quite optimistic that 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 kind of you know dominance of western philosophies is is ready to be ready to be unpacked and rethought by a lot of development partners but it's going to take a lot of work it's not going to happen overnight and this this links to to the next question you have said on several occasions that uh, we need to decolonize climate change migration knowledge and so I think you gave already an answer to a certain extent about how uh, on how this could be done, but can you elaborate a little bit on this decolonizing this type of knowledge? Mm. Yeah, I think there's a few sort of um, colonialist assumptions that sort of have shaped climate migration knowledge in particular. And those are things like that many people in the global south actually really want to move to the global north which doesn't really play out in um the real world if you think about it um you know there's a lot of focus on migration and mobility and its politics but actually the vast majority of the world's population stay put so where they are or in, at least within their local kind of sphere of um you know, mobility. So, you know, why would climate change change that? Like, <laughs> um, there doesn't seem to be any real um, kind of logical link between, you know, somehow climate change would make people really want to move very far away from where they are at the moment. Like, it just doesn't make sense when you think about it like that. So, but those kind of assumptions are very much built into a lot of the, you um, a lot of the thinking on this and there's also um you know that the idea that the global north is the right place for expertise um or that might be changing or the right space um to for, for refuge you know like why not think about a local um a more local solution a more local neighbor that's not necessarily in the global north for um populations that might need to move there's a colonial thinking in the way that um, vulnerable places in the global south are perceived some of them just are not seen as being worth saving um, sometimes in some of the more brutal kind of discourses of the global north so but then again that 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 can play out in in, in different complex ways there's the Netherlands example um, you know which everyone knows is a country that has always existed below sea level 
and yet the inevitable uninhabitability narrative which we discussed earlier doesn't ever seem to attach itself to the Netherlands um you know but the climate risks there are also quite um significant and even within the Netherlands itself I think there's a little bit of an underappreciation about you know how much adaptation might need to take place um is it it's something that about the Netherlands that makes them more deserving of the right to have this assumption that they are, are able and um, deserve to adapt in place because nobody's talking about the Netherlands becoming climate refugees very much. So, you know, decolonisation means unpacking these kind of assumptions and making genuine space for those affected to drive solutions and not, you know, tokenistic stuff about giving them a voice, but really actually having um those affected like say what they need to say and have it listened to so for example you know why doesn't the global media pay attention to this innovative land reclamation that's going on in Tuvalu but very much focus on the Tuvalu 2.0 because both were you know had um media campaigns at the COP so why did the global media choose to focus on one and not the other that to, that to me is an, is an area where decolonization could be very helpful. Yeah, fascinating. Um, what, are, what are your recommendations for sort of policymakers and researchers in Pacific Rim countries like Australia, New Zealand or Japan who want to support peoples and governments in the Pacific Island countries and their struggles with the effects of the climate emergency? I mean, what, if, you, if you had, um, you know, the, the minister in charge of uh, climate diplomacy from Australia in front of you now, what, what would you want to say to him um, about, you know, your, your feelings about the most productive and useful kinds of assistance that could be provided? Similar to what I just said, it's just a lot of time, spend a lot of time actually in the countries observing um, what's being done already and listening to the leaders and the policymakers and the citizens on on, on what, what it is that actually can be helpful. Like I've seen external org organizations go into places like Tuvalu with their own preconceived ideas about what needs to, to be done um, and not doing the either the background work or the genuine listening to really partner properly with say the Tuvaluan government to together derive solutions. So, you know, it, in places like Tuvalu, this is, they've been thinking about this for several decades. It's not like they've just been sitting around uh, waiting, waiting for someone to come in with a with a solution. They, they, they're, they're making their own plans. They're making their own strategies. They're making their own policies. And so partners need to, you know, come in and actually look at those policies and work with those policies rather than saying, well, actually, we think what you need is something completely different and this is what we think we should fund. Um, and, you know, to, to be honest, this seems to be happening in, in Tuvalu. There's a lot of Australian um, ministers and, um, you know, senior government people going to Tuvalu and touring the land reclamation sites and having meetings with, the, um, with their counterparts in Tuvalu, uh, which has not happened um, to anywhere near the same extent in the past so you know these kind of things look like they might be happening at least in the Australian context in the Tuvalu context so whether they are actually genuinely listening let's be hopeful um but but basically you know to listen and work on solutions together rather than going in with these external ideas about what solutions would be best. Thank you um Carol for reminding us of the need um on the part of all of us living in Australia, New Zealand, Japan, or wherever, for much, much higher levels of uh, cultural sensitivity, mm -hmm. um, much higher and better understandings of um, what it means to adapt in situ rather than out of place. Um, so on behalf of uh, TPI and um, Volker and his program, I'd just like to thank you very, very much for sharing your own wisdom on these issues. And I very much hope that uh, we can continue to kind of develop um, more opportunities for more appreciative listening uh, and uh, a better and deeper understanding of, of, of how to stand alongside those who are confronting some very deep and dire existential crises.